She wanted to go last. So now we're going to have an announcement by Cindy. It's a precious thing when our children are small and if your grandparents, as Tim and I now are, you love to tell stories and show pictures of how sweet your little ones are. And one of my favorite memories when I was a young believer, um, because Tim and I got saved, um, we were young parents, we had a, a two-year-old child, um, we were invited to attend a good fundamental church. And my experience from church had been in childhood and I hadn't been back as an adult. And this gracious family welcomed us in, made a point of meeting us, learning our names, telling us theirs, and they took my children, my child, to a nursery. And Jonathan became confident and he looked forward to every Sunday arriving at church because that was his special place. And when my little Liam comes, who is now three, the minute he hits the doors, he runs to our church's nursery. He knows that's a place that's just for him. You guys, this is a ministry, not just to mom and dad, but to the child. The child learns immediately that they are welcome and they are part of our family here. And they learn their names. I love to see Joel carrying Nehemiah. I love to see little Mason going around. The children need us to be part of their lives at church, not just at home, not your personal family, but God's family here, the same way that we feel when we walk in and we know that we're loved and our brothers and sisters are here. We need help in the church nursery. Maybe you can't do it every single month, but you could do it occasionally. You can hold a baby who might cry or need changed, or need to be distracted for 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> they do sometimes, but the next shift is coming and you can hand them off, which is like being the grandparent when you give them back to the parents after spoiling them. It's not just something we do to take care of mom and dad, although that's part of it. It is a very um, discouraging thing when families arrive to find out that they are expected to sit in the nursery with their own child. It's our chance to love on that baby. I invite you to tell Katie that you would be willing to do a service on occasion. We're rather short-handed, and I'm hoping the Lord answers our prayer on um, Palm Sunday and Easter Day especially to introduce families of our community to this church. You have so much to offer. We do it in the name of Christ. And I just would invite you to be brave, find Katie Wagner, say, I can hold a baby for 45 minutes. The Lord's blessed us and we've grown. Please consider this as a ministry that you could do. We need your help. You can also pay me a little extra to cut my sermon down some. So. You know, the church can make a little extra money that way, Joe. What do you think? <laughs> you took it away. Yeah, you Indian giver, you. You can see there's offering baskets on the uh, offering boxes in the back. We're going to take up a special love offering today for J.P. Braga. He has sent some pictures to me recently uh, of his home, and he was talking about how hot it is in his house. Uh, we have some pictures. I don't know if we have them today. We do. But what he has is just tin over top of his house, and there's no ceiling. And it's, it's really hot, he says. I guess the temperature there is about 115, 120 degrees. And that heat just radiates down into their house. That's the inside of his home. And so you can see that it's uh, hot. He had asked to see if we could help. Actually, he didn't ask us to help. He just said, can pray that we can raise up money. This is their church where they have, actually the church that they're renting is a lot nicer than his house is. And they had five people saved there, he said, this past week. And so that's the first services they had. And so he sends me, he sends me always pictures and tells me people that he has uh, counsel for salvation. But I thought as a church, 
uh, he hasn't asked, but I, I told him as a church that we were going to take up his love offering for him. And so if you feel inclined to give toward that, all the money that will be taken up on the, in the offering baskets will go to him and try to help put a ceiling in his house to cut down some of the heat that's coming into their home. They just had a, a newborn recently, and I'm sure it is pretty hot with them. And he is a young man, and he looks for us to, uh, he looks to me to be his spiritual father. He calls me dad all the time, talks to me about his, my grandkids in the Philippines, that sort of thing. So he does look upon us as to be the answer to his prayer in many cases because they don't have any money, any way to get money, any way to do things most of the time. And so it's just an opportunity for us to show our love for them. And so don't forget before you leave uh, to do that. We'll just take it this morning. And if you can't do it today and you want to do it later, just you can hand it to me or give it to Thelma and Thelma will put it where it needs to go. And so be praying about that. We have an opportunity to have an impact and clear on the other side of the world for people. And that church, you know, they call it the Daniels Missionary Baptist Church Mission or something to that effect. I kid you not, Ted. That's what he calls it. So be praying for them. Amen? Let me take that part. No, that's okay. <laughs> All right, there are a few announcements. Um, we're going to do a teen movie tonight until we figured out that the uh, ABC drama team is going to be here tonight. So the movie's canceled. So come back for the ABC drama team. The uh, skeet sh or the sporting clay shoot is going to be either April 7th or April 14th. If you prefer either one of those days or you really don't care, um, talk to Rob or myself or Pete, one of the guys, and uh, we're going to try to see which day is best. Cost is about $40. There will be some walking involved um, uphill, downhill, out in the woods. So most everybody can do that. It's not going to be like... <coughs> A mountainside, but there will be some walking. Be a good time. Brian Safe House, we're collecting laundry detergent the rest of March and through the month of April. The boxes are out there. This is like Tide, um, just laundry detergent. If you can bring that, put it in the tote. Like I said, ABC Drama Team's going to be here tonight. And Easter service is going to start at 11 o'clock, a little bit different this year. Uh, 7.30 is going to be the breakfast. Guys, if you want to come help, it's over there. It's really early. It's like 5, 5.30. You don't have to, like, take a bath before you come. <laughs> Brush your teeth. You don't have to, yeah. You can wear whatever if you're going to cook. Just wash your hands, hopefully. You don't have to be nice. There will be coffee for you coffee drinker people. And then we'll cook. And hopefully by 7.30 everything will be ready and somewhat tasty. And so 7.30 is breakfast, 10, 11 o'clock is the morning worship service. So if you want to come out and help cook, be there early. And, yeah, you can just grumble and grouch a lot. I normally do. 7 o'clock is sunrise service. That's right. Oops. 7 o'clock sunrise, then 7.30 breakfast. I always think about the food. Sorry. Let us do go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do come to you this morning just in awe of your splendor and awe of your majesty, just uh, loving you, Lord, just looking to you for the answers to this life, looking to you for the, the great gift of salvation that you've provided, looking to you, Lord, for the meaning, the meaning of our existence. We thank, Lord, of those that can't be here through illness or can't be here through just a loss of love for you or maybe even no love for you and I feel sorry for those folks Lord and I, I have pity on them and I pray that their soul will be stirred and their their heart will be warmed by you the only hope that we have in this world the only hope that is possible you gave yourself you gave your precious blood on the cross so many years ago and Lord I just want to uplift your name give you all the honor and the praise and the glory and just thank you today for being here with us. You sent your spirit amongst us. You inhabit us. You're here with us. And I thank you for this opportunity. We love you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen.
48.1 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If you would stand with us this morning, we're going to sing How Great Thou Art. And if the ladies would sing the second verse and the men the third verse, and then we'll all join back again on the fourth. So everyone will begin on the first, ladies second, men on the third, everyone back on the fourth.
fellowship with one another, and then we'll come back together and finish with some time of worship and singing. song we're going to sing this morning is Here I Am to Worship, and as we take these last minutes here together um, and ponder and reflect on all that God has done for us in our week, um, and even just thinking of Easter coming up and Palm Sunday, uh, and just reflecting again on the Lord, the, the God, the Savior, our Christ, um, who has given everything for us. And so as we ponder now and, and come to the song, Here I Am to Worship, uh, let's truly think about who we are worshiping, letting all other distractions aside. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope all the light spent with you.
Today and the time that we have here to spend in your word and worshiping you through song. God, we want to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor because you deserve it. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This time to
Let's open our Bibles here this morning to the book of Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 is going to be our focus here this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about the subject of the blood of Christ. Nothing but the blood. The Bible, people have said that if you cut the Bible anywhere, it'll bleed. And that's true in some cases, I guess. There's three main cords that run through the Bible. You have the cord, the dark cord of sin. It's just there. It talks about shame and degradation and how bad we are because of what has become of us because of sin. But you also have the scarlet red cord that speaks of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from Genesis to the book of Revelation, you find the blood of Christ sprinkled through the entire Bible. So the truth is, the Bible, you cut it anywhere, it's going to what? It's going to bleed. That's so true. But also you have what's called, I call it the golden cord. The fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again to reign and to rule in this world. And we need to be praying, thy kingdom come, because it is coming. And we need to be prepared for that when it comes. I want us to focus our attention on the, the middle cord that I spoke of as we're talking about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scarlet cord of the precious blood that was shed with us because there is a highway of blood that runs through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We'll look at it just for a few minutes here this morning. And I think it's exciting because people today in many churches don't want to talk about the blood. As we approach Easter time, I think our focus must be upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 9.22, which we'll look at just in a minute, that gives us remission of our sin, forgiveness of our sin. Now, before I go too far, let me just say there are four areas that I think that need to be preached constantly in the church over and over and over and over again. The first area is the book, the Bible, the Word of God. God has given to us His Word. That needs to be preached over and over and over again, that it is inspired by God. It is God's Word to you. It is God's Word to me. But not only should the Bible be preached constantly and always in the church, but the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the precious blood. Without God coming to earth as man and shedding His blood, there'd be no hope for any of us. And so the church needs to preach the book because the Bible tells us without the Word of God, you can't be saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And you cannot be saved without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have the book, we have the blood, and we also have the birth. And I'm not talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the second birth. You have to be born twice. You have to be born again, Jesus said. And so we need to preach constantly about the book, constantly about the blood, constantly about the birth that we need to have to enter the kingdom of God. But also we need to preach about the blessed hope. Jesus is coming. Maybe today. People aren't prepared for him to come. In many cases, we're not prepared for him to come. But he is coming nonetheless. And so I want to talk to you today about the blood of Christ as we approach the Easter season. You know, many churches call it a kind of a gory, primitive thing. It's not gory, it's glory. If you think about what God did for us, Amen. He saved us by coming to the earth as a man to die upon the cross for our sin. Now, understand this. If you're unsaved here this morning, you need to listen to what I'm saying. Because I'm going to be taking you up the slopes of Calvary today. And we're going to see the blood-drenched sides of that slope where the Lord Jesus Christ shed His blood for you. And there's a cross that's been lifted up there, and it stands before you in hell. To get to hell, you have to go over the cross. And you have to take the blood of Christ, and you have to walk on it and treat it as an unholy thing. And so God has put a roadblock for you here this morning saying, Hey, this far, look at me. Look at me and live. So it's a choice that you have to make today. God has done that for you. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. He puts that there for us to see. So if you're unsaved today, it's here for you. But what about for us that are born again? What about, what about us who are children of God? We should leave here today praising and thanking God for the salvation of the cross, for the salvation of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you and for me. Amen? 
It's amazing to me sometimes that God's people leave church just like they came in, kind of dead. We need to leave this church alive and thanking God today that I'm alive. I lost a good pastor friend of mine just a couple days ago. He's in heaven today. I can praise God for that. He did a funeral yesterday. Man got saved two weeks ago. Older man. Praise God. He's in heaven. We have so much to thank God for that no matter what happens to me today or tomorrow, I have the hope of Christ that can never be taken away from me. So look in your Bibles here, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And just read with me as I read it to you. It says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of the blood there is no remission. Now that word remission simply means forgiveness. And so, beloved, understand this. Without the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no remission from sin. There is no forgiveness of sin. You have to come by the blood. That's the only way that you can come. And so let me just talk to you a little bit about the blood here this morning. And I'm going to try to use this and talk at the same time, and that's hard for me to do two things at once, but I'm going to try. The prophecy of the blood, let's look at that first, because as I mentioned to you, you find that cord of the blood going from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. Calvary was not an accident. It was a planned appointment. You have to understand that. God was not surprised when his, Lord went to that, when his son went to that cross, when our Lord went to the cross. The prophecy of the blood. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, and speak of the Antichrist, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, the Antichrist, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, when? Slain from the foundation of the what? World. And so before God created the earth and flung it out into space, before he created the stars and the galaxies and all of those things, Calvary was on his heart. Calvary was on his mind. It wasn't a surprise to God. And Christ was slain in the heart and the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Before anything was created, Jesus Christ was coming to give his life for you. That should excite you, beloved. That should excite you. It should make you be praising God and thanking God for the salvation that he's given to you because you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But I praise him today for it, don't you? So if you want to talk about the old-time religion, one of the things that we talked about at the Indian Creek Association, they were like almost 180 years old, Baptist churches meeting. They always talked about the old-time religion. I'm here to tell you, if Calvary was in the mind of Christ before the foundation of the world, that is the old-time religion. Amen? Amen? Something to think about. That's where we need to focus our attention on Him, that old-time religion. So let's go back into the book of Genesis. I'll have it on the screen for you. Let's go back into the book of Genesis and look at the blood and see how important the shedding of blood has been. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, you find the very first prophecy of the blood. And the Bible says there also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God, made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, we live in a day today where people love animals more than people. You know, to be honest with you. God was the first furrier here. He realized he killed an animal and made coats of skin to clothe Adam and Eve with, and so it's not wrong to wear fur in that sense. God gives us pictures, illustrations of the blood of the Lord, and it's pictured in all of these areas where we see the shedding of blood. Do you realize that when Adam and Eve sinned, their eyes were opened, and they knew things they never knew before? And so what they did, Adam went into the the woods, the woods, the woods, that sounds good to me. He went into the woods and he made himself uh, fig leaves, didn't he? He made himself a suit of fig leaves. He looked good. I can see Eve coming out and say, man, you look good. <laughs> and what did Eve do? Eve, of course, she sewed together some fig leaves too. And Adam said, man, green is your color. You're looking good, baby. And they were feeling pretty good for themselves, what they had made with their own hands. Until Jesus, until God came to walk in the garden with them. And what happened? When God started walking in the garden and they looked at the works of their hands, they realized that they could not cover the sin of their flesh and they hid themselves in the trees and the woods because they realized that their covering was not sufficient because they had no righteousness. And so God made for them a blood atonement. God made for them a covering. Why? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission 
There is no remission. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, we see in the process of time, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Here's a man who wants to worship the Lord. As Adam and Eve, they made fig leaves, a coat of, of fig leaves to hide their nakedness with their own hands. And God said, no, there has to be a shedding of blood. And so here you have Cain coming to worship God, and he brings the works of his hands to God. And of course, you, you know the story. It wasn't accepted. It says, Abel also brought of the first leans of the flock and of the fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Well, he threw a fit. Look what I did. It's good enough. But it wasn't good enough. Cain's offering was of his own hands, and you're not saved by your works. You're saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you. So when God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's sacrifice, what was he saying? What was he saying? He's telling us here in the very first pages of the Bible, the book of God, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There has to be a shedding of blood. I mean, Cain brought his vegetables, but you can't get blood from a turnip. Can you? Where do you get blood from? From life. There had to be a life given for you. There had to be a life given for me. Let's go to another place in Genesis. Uh oh, we died. I'm okay. There we go. There we go. Rookies. I'm sorry. Did I say that? <laughs> Now, here in Genesis chapter 8, we're looking at thousands of years now, about 2,000 years after Cain and Abel was there to the flood. And, of course, Noah built an ark and saved the animals and saved his family. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? It says in Genesis 8, 20, you see it on the screen there, then Noah, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And so all this time had passed, but you see there's still a need for what? A blood sacrifice. It's there. And you can just keep going through the book of Genesis and you keep finding this over and over again. You come next to a man named Abram. Abram. He would later become Abraham. And God told Abram to take your son, your only son Isaac, and take him up to the, the mountains of Moriah and sacrifice him there to me as a blood sacrifice. And what is Abram thinking? Abraham thinking, God has promised me that my offspring will be like the stars of the sky. Abram walked by faith. He said, I don't understand it, God, but I know that you're God, and I know that you can raise him up again because you made a promise, and your promises are always true. And so Abram took his son, his only son Isaac, and took him to the mountain and was going to sacrifice him there. Was going to sacrifice him there. And he took him. And he was getting ready to cut the throat of his child. To shed his precious son's blood because God had commanded him to. Verse 13, it says, Then Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And that's there for a reason. By his horns. You have to remember, this is all pointing to Jesus. We have the, the crown of thorns upon our Lord 2,000 years later. But this was for Abraham a vision, a vision of this one who was coming. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. The substitutionary atonement, we find it through the scriptures. Those animals died to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Abel's offering was accepted because of the blood sacrifice that was made because without the shedding of blood, there is what? There is no remission of sin. There's no remission of sin. And you can go through the Bible. Let's go to Genesis. And we find in Genesis the children of Israel were in bondage in the land of Egypt. And God says, you know, 
I'm going to do something wonderful tonight. I'm going to set you free. Israel was excited. And he says, I want every Israelite to take a lamb, one lamb for family, and I want you to take the blood of that lamb and put it on the, the doorpost and the lintel of that house. It says, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plagues shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So he says, when I see the blood, I will what? I will pass over you. Now, they could have put rubies and diamonds on the door and lintels. They could have put all kinds of wonderful things. They could have even taken a spotless lamb and put it outside the front door. It would have done no good at all because there has to be a shedding of blood. Because the Bible says without the what? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. They needed the blood so God would pass over them. Aren't you so glad that God's going to pass over you because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, when death comes knocking on your door, and I don't know when that's going to be, but it's coming. You can praise God that death has no power over you anymore because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because through that blood, you have received forgiveness of your sin. Let's go into the book of Exodus again. Here's a long verse. I don't know if you can see it very well. It says, you shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands to the, the head of the bull, and that symbolizes the transferring of the guilt of the people upon that young bull. Then it says, You shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. Again, what is God saying? What is God saying? God is saying without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. You see it? And so we have the, the prophecy, we have the prophecy of the saving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ all through the Bible. It's there. Let's look secondly at the provision of the blood. The provision of the blood. Again, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Get this in your mind because this is an important verse. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with what? With blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now, if you're in Hebrew still, go to chapter 10. And look at these verses with me. Hebrews chapter 10. You've had all these Old Testament sacrifices from Genesis all the way up to the Lord. Sacrifice after sacrifice, blood spilled after blood spilled, sacrifice, lambs, bulls, bullocks, turtle doves, they were all there. Did they suffice? Was it sufficient for them? No, it wasn't. The Bible says in chapter 10, verse 1, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of things can never with these same sacrifices which they offered continually year by year make those who approach perfect. These sacrifices that we've been making for thousands of years simply did what? They covered sin. And what they showed us was this was a promissory note of this one who was coming. This one who wasn't going to cover sin from year to year and move it on down the road, kick the can down the road. This one was coming to do away with sin forever and all time. The Lord Jesus Christ was coming to do that. Look at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he cometh into the world, he's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, sacrifice and offering he would not desire. That is, it doesn't satisfy me, but a body you have prepared for me. God prepared a body. Mary, a virgin, conceived and bore a son, and his name was called Jesus. It was a sinless body. And that, my dear friend, is the provision of the saving blood, a perfect sacrifice given for you and given for me. Why did God become man? Why do we have Christmas? Why do we have the incarnation? Because without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And that's why God prepared a body for his son to come so he could remit sin. Jesus was the Lamb of God, chosen before the foundations of the world to come and give his life for you and for me. You know, when Abraham 
was on that Mount Moriah getting ready to kill his son. His son looked at him and said, Daddy, where's the, where's the sacrifice? Things are looking bleak. And by the way, Isaac was not a little child, I don't believe, at this time. He was a man. Placed himself in submission to his father. And what did Abraham say? God will provide a sacrifice. Abraham was walking by faith, wasn't he? Abraham saw the day that Jesus Christ was coming, and the Bible says, and he was glad. I think really God gave him a glimpse because he's going to take his son's life, but here was a, a ram to take the place of his son to be used as a substitute for his son. Of course, many years later, you had John the Baptist looking across the river, seeing Jesus, the Son of God, walking toward him, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's the one. That's the one that's coming. The one who's coming for you, the one who's coming for me, the one who's coming to shed his blood for us. That one. And look at verse 12 of chapter 10, if you will. It says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand, the right hand of God. You know, when the high priest would come and do the sacrifice, he would come into the Holy of Holies one time a year, on the day of Yom Kippur, is it the day of sacrifice that they would do. He would take all the regalia of high priest off and just put on a simple white robe, and he would come with a basin of blood, and he would part the curtain, and he would walk into the Holy of Holies. And I'm sure that he was scared to death. He was intervening on the behalf of all the people. And he realized if he had sin in his life, God would take his life. So he had to be right. He had to make sure that he did everything in accordance to God's word. And so he walked in there and he took the blood and began to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, which was the covering of the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant was the law, the perfect law that God expects us to live by, that we can't live by because of sin. And the blood covered that truth and moved it on down the road. But then the priest would leave and, and walk out of the holy place and walk out and another year was done. Year after year after year, they walked in and walked out, walked in and walked out. It was never finished. There was never any furniture in the tabernacle or in the temple for the priest to sit down because his work was never finished. Constantly making sacrifices, constantly over and over and over again. But it says in verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for this year, forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down because it was what? It was finished. It was finished. The sacrifice had been paid in full by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was one sacrifice for all forever. And that is the provision of the saving blood. I don't know, sometimes I have a tendency to get up here and realize that I don't have the vocabulary or the knowledge or the mind to be able to tell you what I really think about Calvary, what I think about the Lord Jesus Christ. I always feel inadequate when I do this. Anytime I preach from the pulpit, I feel that way. And to try to describe the crucifixion, I don't think, is something that we can do. And, and you have to be careful. You just don't see it in, in a book, a picture in a book. There's more to it than just that. That's God Almighty coming for you, to do that for you. And I found these words written by somebody else that says this, Tongue cannot tell, throat cannot sing, hand cannot paint. The tragedy that was enacted on the hill called Calvary. Gather the wail of the icy winds that howl through the frozen north. Extract the heart despair of a mother watching wild beasts tear at the throat of her baby. Capture all the hopeless groan and helpless shrieks of the damned. And with all of this at your command, you will still be unable to paint the picture that is Calvary. Only the damned in hell can begin to know how much Jesus suffered. Beloved, you know that is so true. That is so true. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, No man takes my life from me. I lay it down again. And, of course, while he was on the cross, people were kept pointing at him and saying, you know, he saved others, himself he cannot save. But that was not quite true. It was himself that he would not save. You know, in, in another place in the scripture, he says, I could have called 12 legions of angels to come to his aid. That's 72,000 angels. One angel in one night killed 185 Assyrians. Imagine what 72,000 could do. 
But he didn't call them. He suffered for a purpose because it was chosen before the foundations of the world for this to take place. He laid down his life. He came to die. He, covered, he came to suffer and to bleed and to die for you and for me. And, you know, if they're, they're pointing their fingers at him. He said, if you're the Son of God, come down from that cross and we'll believe. What they should have done was gathered there at that tomb on that Easter morning and said, if you're the Son of God, you come out of there, dead man. And if they would have waited, guess what? He did come out because he was who he claimed to be. And so we have the power of the blood as the next thought. Our last thought, we have the prophecy, we have the provision of the blood. But again, it says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. You know, there's some people who think that the blood of Christ, the Christian faith in this sense, is very uncouth, very primitive, you know, uncultured. You know, we've gone beyond that. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved is, is the power of God. There's power in the blood of the Lord. Don't we sing a song like that? There is power, power, wonder-working power. I should sing a special. No, I don't thank you. So what does the, the blood do? What's the power does it have? It redeems us. We've looked at that so many times here this morning. It redeems us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct, your vain imagination, the KJV, received by tradition from your fathers, but how were you saved? But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Without spot. You know, in the Roman Empire time, there was about 50 million slaves there. And they could purchase themselves if they had enough money with gold and silver from slavery. Most people couldn't. Most of them died in slavery. Jesus Christ came to free us from that. To free us. It redeems us. There is no hope for you. There's no hope for me except for the cross of Christ and the blood that was shed there for us. And we preach it all the time because people, the world needs to see that there is a roadblock saying... Stop here and go no further because hell is coming on the other side. And people still transgress the cross. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us hope. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said this, When that blood fell on the ground beneath that cross, it fell on the dust. And the dust said to the, the grass, it is finished. And the grass said to the shrubs, it is finished. And the shrubs said to the trees, it is finished. And the trees said... To the leaves on the trees, it is finished. And the leaves said to the birds on those trees, it is finished. And the birds flew up to the clouds and said, it is finished. And the clouds ascended to the stars and said, it is finished. And the stars went into the throne room of God and said, it is finished. I think Spurgeon understood something. It is paid in full. It's done. It is finished. And that, beloved, is what redeems us. It's the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so remember what it does. It saves us, but it also brings us near to God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, what is it? I advanced twice. Oh, I would have seen that probably in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Dwayne, I can hear you laughing, brother, I can tell you. See, I even saw you, Mike. That's pretty good, don't you think? Usually he's waving at me. He said, you never saw me, did you? I said, no. Shoot up a flare next time. I could probably see it better. It brings us near. It brings us near. But now, in Christ Jesus, who you once were far off, you've been brought what? Near by the blood of Christ. The high priest had no business going into the Holy of Holies without the blood. And we can't get near to God because of our sinfulness. It keeps us separated from God forever. That's why the blood of Christ is so important. Because it allows us to bridge that sinfulness and go to God, to have that closeness. I love it in the Bible where it says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be with you always. No matter what you go through or where you go, He's going to be there. It brings us near to Him. And then we have John 17, 3, talks about eternal life is to know Him, to have that intimacy with Him. You can't have that unless you're saved. 
But once you're saved and the blood of Christ knocks down that roadblock that kept you from coming into his presence, there is nothing grander than having that intimacy with him to be drawn near to God. Don't you want God near you today? God made it possible for you because he came and died upon that cross for you. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off, and that was us because of our sin, have been brought near by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the blood that brings us into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the priest wouldn't come for the, the Lord without the blood. We can't either. The only way to go home, the only way to go home is by the blood, by the blood of the Lord. And so it brings us near. What's the next one since you already saw it? It makes peace. Mike, I thought you'd yell real quick, you know. It makes peace. Not only does it redeem us, not only does it bring us near to God, but it, it makes us acceptable in the sense that it gives us peace. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross. The Bible tells us that we are at war with God. He has talked about the wrath of God being revealed to us, to sinful people. You know, today, people think that God's not angry with them. I'm here to tell you God is angry with you. Your sins are not going to go to hell. You are. You have to understand that. The only way to avert the wrath of God is to accept the blood of Christ in your life. And when you haven't, you just, it's like you stand there with your fist in God's face and say, no, I will not accept the blood that was shed for me. That's what sin does. You're at war with God. It's only the blood of Christ that can make peace. Give us the peace with God, and because we have peace with God, we have the peace of God. I don't know about you, but I need that sometimes. You know, when some Christian person comes to you and jumps all over you about something stupid? That happens, you know, not just for the pastor. It happens to all of us sometimes. I can just sit back and say, hey, it's okay. I'm just as dumb as that person is. Because we're all the same. And I realize that could be me doing that. So I say, Lord, help me through this situation. Instead of getting angry and upset, I'm cool. Why? Because I have the peace of God. It's not all about me. It's all about the Lord. And so it makes peace with us. Let me give you another one. It cleanses us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Aren't you glad of that? You know, in my life, in my life today, I realize that I'm born again, I'm saved. All of my sins, past, present, and future, has been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, I still sin today. I'm a saint who sins. And I can go to God and he cleanses me. That's not talking about my relationship. It's talking about my fellowship with him. My relationship, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I became his son. I became part of his family. I can't be taken away. I can't be changed. It's in the blood. But my fellowship can be messed up because of my stupidness. I have a lot of that sometimes. And I think you might have a little bit of that too. But aren't you so proud and so glad for the Lord that he cleanses us? No matter what we've done, no matter what we've slipped back into, he cleanses us. I don't have to get saved all over again. I just need to claim the blood in my life. And so it's the blood that redeems. It's the blood that draws us near. It's the blood that makes peace. It's the blood that cleanses. And let me give you one more. It's the blood that gives us victory over Satan. It says in Revelation 12, 11, And they, speaking of the saints, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. You know, I'm so thankful that I'm a child of God. I'm so thankful that I realize what the blood is all about. Look in Hebrews chapter 10 again, and we'll kind of wind this up. Verses 28 through verse 31. It says, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot 
counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then verse 31, I think, is perhaps one of the most eye-opening verses in the entire Bible. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You realize, beloved, that when the Passover lamb was killed, the blood was put on the lintels and on the doorpost. There was no blood put on the threshold. You're to walk under the blood, not over the blood. Treat it as something that is special. Everybody in this room here today has that choice. You can walk out of this room and walk under it or walk over it. It's a choice you have to make. You know, I wonder what it would have been like back in Pharaoh's time when Pharaoh's oldest son came to him and said, Hey, Dad, I, I heard Moses and all the Hebrews are talking that their God's going to come and visit us with a curse. And they were saying that, you know, we need to take blood from a lamb and put it on the doorpost and the lintel because this, this angel of death is coming and I understand it's going to kill the firstborn. I have some interest in that since I am the firstborn. And what's his daddy say? His daddy says, oh, hey, kid, don't worry about it. We're in the palace. We got tons of money. We got, we got weapons. We got everything. Nothing's going to bother us here. And so little boy, I thanks, Dad, for all that confidence you give me. I know Moses is just a fraud. And so he went to bed that night. And, of course, the shrieks of the dead began to wake people up. And that boy never woke up. Because he treated the blood of the Lord as an unclean thing. You know, there's people today who do that exact same thing. It's foolishness. It's foolishness to them. It's foolishness to you. I don't know. It's what sets us free. It's the provision we have, the prophecy of the blood, the provision that's given to us, and the power that it possesses to transform us. You know, I know Easter will have people in church. You know, you have a lot of people just come to church on Easter. A lot of people come to church Easter and Christmas. Those are the good ones because they come twice a year instead of once a year. It doesn't mean what it needs to mean. And, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who think they're going to go to heaven or aren't going to go there. That's a sad thing to say. But where are you at? How do you treat the blood? Is it special to you? Do you read the Bible? Do you study the Bible? Do you pray to the God of the Bible? Are you overwhelmed with the Calvary that came so long ago for you and for me? Do you want to go tell people about this Calvary, about this God who loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you, that God died in your place? Do you have that desire to do that? You know, I think if we don't have that desire, what we actually do is, is treat the blood of the Lord as an unholy thing. Because you are his ambassadors. You are his disciples. How can they hear without a a preacher. How can they hear unless we're sent? And God sent us, didn't he? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. At Kmart, at Wendy's, at wherever you happen to go, you go and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he called us. It's the blood that sets people free. It's all through the Bible. It'll bleed if you let it. And we need to see Calvary and see it like that little poem that I gave you, see it from that other perspective, it's overwhelming to understand that. And so, beloved, are, do you know Christ is your Savior today? If you don't, the cross is there saying, hey, stop. Ponder these things before you leave this place because you may not ever have another opportunity to ponder these things. But the roadblock is there. Stop and think and then leave. You can leave under the blood or you can leave over the blood. Which will you do? Christian friend, what does Calvary mean to you today? Is it special to you? Are you telling people? Are you looking forward to the time that you'll see Christ face to face? Because the precious blood was shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I'm glad today that I'm forgiven. I hope that you are too. If you're not, you need someone to talk to. After we pray and everybody stands up and begins to go their different ways, I'm right here. If you want to be saved, all you have to do is come and talk to me. If you have questions about things, all you have to do is come to talk to me. That's all you have to do. What's it worth to you? What's it worth to you? Let's pray.